everyone. In this video, we're going to go over how to solve the challenge problem at the end of your FNTs from DL1. Now, in this problem, we have two graphs of a wave, one of the wave as a function of position and one of the wave as a function of time. Our goal is to figure out how to write down the wave equation based on this information. Let's start with part A. Explain how the y of t graph tells you whether this wave is moving to the right or to the left. If we read the problem carefully, we can see that the position graph shows us what the wave looks like at t equals zero. In other words, this is a photograph of the wave at the initial point in time. Note, this graph is not a picture of the wave like the other graph. It just shows us how the buoy moves up and down as time passes. So we want to know which direction the wave is moving. Well, let's consider where the buoy is at the initial time. According to this graph, at time t equals zero, the buoy is above the equilibrium point and headed downwards. In the y of x graph, the buoy is situated right here at x equals zero. So let's use this information to solve this problem. Let's imagine that the buoy is sitting here and the wave is moving to the left as time passes. If the wave was moving to the left as time passes, the buoy would have to start by going up to the top of the crest before it could go back down into a trough. However, based on this graph, we see that that is not the case. The buoy immediately starts traveling downwards as soon as time passes. This tells us that this wave has to be moving to the right. If you like, you can think about what the wave on the left-hand side of the axis would look like. Now it becomes even more clear that if the buoy is sitting here, the wave must go this way in order for the buoy to start traveling down this hill. Remember, it's the wave that's moving, not the buoy itself. So we have to imagine that the buoy sits right here and the wave moves to the left or right under it. Now we want to write an equation for the motion of the wave. If we want to do this, we need to know what all the individual terms are. As a refresher, those terms are amplitude, period, wavelength, phase constant, and the equilibrium position. Also recall that the entire wave equation looks like this. Let's use these graphs to figure out what all of these numbers are. Let's start with amplitude. Remember, the amplitude just tells us how tall the wave is, this distance right here. Looking at this graph, it appears to me that the peak is at right about plus 0.1. That's in units of meters. So we know that the amplitude of our wave, this distance, or equivalently, this distance, is equal to about 0.1 meter. What about the time period? The question is, which of these graphs should give us information about the time period? The answer is, it has to be the y of t graph. The y of x graph tells us nothing about how fast the wave actually moves. Remember, it's just a photograph of the wave at a particular time. So we have to look at the y of t graph in order to determine the time period of the wave. Remember, this graph is showing us how the buoy is moving up and down as time passes. The time period of a wave is just the amount of time it takes to get from one crest to the next crest. If we figure out the time it takes for a full wave to pass by the buoy, we've determined the time period of the wave. Let's start here in a trough. This lowest point of the wave occurs approximately 
three seconds after the wave starts moving. The next lowest point is over here, roughly 12 seconds after the wave has started moving. The time period of the wave is just the amount of time it takes us to get from here to here, 9 seconds. Now let's look at wavelength. Just as we can't determine the time period by looking at the y of x graph, we can't determine the wavelength by looking at the y of t graph. The y of t graph only tells us how much time it takes for the full wave to pass by. It does not actually tell us how long the wave is. To do that, we need to look at the wave in space, the photograph of the wave at a particular time. We'll do the same exercise, except instead of using a trough, I'll use a peak. Each of the tick marks on this graph represents two tenths of a meter. The first peak occurs right here at 0.2 meters. The next peak appears right here, 1.8 meters to the right of the buoy. The wavelength is just the distance from one crest to the next crest, in this case 1.6 meters. We'll come back to the phase constant in a moment. For now, let's just consider the equilibrium. Looking at this graph, it appears to me that the peaks are the same distance from the x-axis as the trough. This just indicates that the equilibrium of the wave is zero. It hasn't been shifted up or shifted down. Now let's consider the phase constant. This is probably the trickiest part of this problem. Remember, the phase constant just indicates to us where the wave is when both time and position are zero. In other words, when the phase constant is the only thing inside the sine function that has a value. In order to do this, we have to know how the sine function works. And it may be worthwhile for you to go back and do some review about sine functions. I'll post a link in the description of a good overview. So I totally messed this part up the first time I did it, so we're redoing it again in my lovely room. So we're interested in finding the phase constant for this wave. Remember, the phase constant just tells us where the wave starts. It doesn't change the shape or speed of the wave. The easiest way to do this is to pick a point on the wave where you know the value of the sine function. As an example, let's pick this point right here. We know what the time is. It's zero seconds. We also know what the position is. It's 1.8 meters. We also know the value of the sine function. Here, the sine function is at its maximum, corresponding to this peak in the wave. It turns out that the sine function will be at its maximum whenever the argument inside is equal to pi over 2. So we need the inside of our sine function to equal pi over 2 with this value of position and time. So let's write that out. This means that 2 pi t divided by the period minus, because this wave is moving to the right, 2 pi x divided by the wavelength plus the phase constant must equal pi over 2. Now in this graph, time is 0, so we can just cross out this first piece. x at this point is 1.8, so let's plug that in. We divide by the wavelength, which is 1.6 meters. And all this is equal to pi divided by 2. Now all we have to do is rearrange this equation to determine the phase constant.
We've now solved this problem. The phase constant is equal to 11 pi over 4. However, we're going to do something that makes this solution look just a little bit nicer. Because sine repeats every 2 pi, we can always change this number by adding or subtracting 2 pi to it without actually changing what the wave looks like. It's generally standard to try to pick your phase constant to be between 0 and 2 pi. Now, right now, we have a phase constant that is greater than 2 pi, so let's subtract 2 pi from it to get a number that's between 0 and 2 pi. These phase constants are exactly equivalent in the sine function because they only differ by a factor of 2 pi. So now we can write out our full wave equation for this wave. And there we have it, the complete wave equation. This wave equation specifies exactly this wave that we were given in the problem, meaning using only this, we could always reproduce exactly what we have been given here without any additional information.